I'm Bill Morrison, and this is uh, Season 1, Episode 3 for Designing Big Monitor Systems and Control Room Design. We design and construct big monitors under the BIGS trade name, so we're concerned about monitoring accuracy. We want to make sure that the room does not create reflections that are going to cause and interfere with the first arrival from the big monitor system. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have phase cancellations and frequency response anomalies, especially if you have multiple reflections that are causing clusters of, uh, of cancellations and reinforcements in certain frequency areas. So you can really distort and uh, color the uh, uh, accuracy of your monitor system if your control room is not uh, correctly designed. There are a couple of um, articles I wanted to reference uh, that actually address addresses these issues in control rooms, and one of them is an article by Tom Hidley entitled um, Make a Room Sing for $3,500. Uh, it's probably cost a little more than that now, but the idea is to economically treat these reflections so that you do have an accurate environment. Uh, Tom Hidley is the, probably the uh, highest paid designer in the world, and he famously designed BOP Studios and Masterphonics in Nashville. So he knows what he's talking about. Um, his, he really advocates using absorption uh, in the control room to control those reflections. And then I wrote an article for Mix Magazine, or a couple articles for Mix Magazine, on using geometry in the control room to actually control reflections to achieve monitoring accuracy as well. There are also a couple of uh, programs that are good to really uh, see what's going on as far as control room interaction with monitoring systems. One of them is uh, REW, which has a room simulator program in it. And I'd recommend REW because it also if you hook up a microphone to it and what have you, it has some FFT programs in there that let you analyze the accuracy of your monitor system and how it's performing, first arrival accuracy, uh, distortion, what have you. But the rim simulator portion of it actually analyzes what and lets you see what happens to monitoring accuracy uh, when you change the dimensions of your room and some of the acoustical treatments in the room the positioning of the speakers and the position of the um, uh, listener's position. So it's, uh, it's uh, quite uh, revealing as to uh, what is required to achieve accurate monitoring in a control room. Um, the other program is EASE, uh, E-A-S-E, Electroacoustic Simulator, which actually allows you to um, analyze a little bit more complex uh, room layouts and room shapes uh, also lets you actually simulate what it would sound like in a particular control room. So it's, it's quite interesting, but uh, it's a little bit more complex to use. <clears throat> a lot of times you'll hear people say that, you know, they listen to a monitor system in one control room, it sounds great, and so they put it in their control room and it doesn't sound quite so good. And uh, the reason is because, you know, your control room is, is just not good. Uh, so you need to uh, make some corrections to it, uh, or you may need to design a new control room uh, if you're planning on building a facility. We want to take a look at those situations. A lot of times uh, you'll have a rectangular uh, space available, this typically. Um, and uh, you want to make sure that your space is sort of enclosed in a shell that is uh, high mass and uh, rigid so it doesn't vibrate. Basically, if uh, your uh, structural walls around the space are, um, you know, flimsy, uh, steel stud and drywall construction that might be in an office type situation, you may need to add additional layers of gypboard and uh, you may want to sandwich plywood or soundboard in between those layers 
of a jib board, and I would recommend using Type X a jib board, which is a fire rated jib board uh, for additional density. Same thing on the ceiling. You may want to, uh, you may have a, uh, a second story above you uh, that you may want to isolate yourself from, or you may have a, a steel roof above you or something that's flimsy and flapping around. You wouldn't want that. So you may need to suspend uh, a uh, gypsum ceiling uh, above this space and may need to be multiple layers of gypsum. Typically you would attach that to a uh, black iron grid and uh, suspend that from the structure. Sometimes uh, using, if you need to for isolation purposes, um, use isolation hangers to uh, suspend that ceiling. Same thing on the floor, you need to have a solid floor. So uh, hopefully it's a concrete floor. Um, you may need to pour a concrete slab if the uh, structure of your building allows it. Uh, you can put hardwood, hardwoods on the floor to also uh, solidify it and add some additional mass to it. So assuming you have a um, shell around your control room, then you need to plan on how you're going to orient your control room. Ideally, you'd want the speakers to be uh, facing into the long dimension of this rectangular space. And you'd want to position those uh, so that they formed an equilateral triangle with the engineer's position. So uh, you would orient your speakers um, so they faced the uh, engineer's position. The engineer needs to be on axis with the speaker system. Generally, speaker systems are designed for accurate time ar arrival and uh, phase response so that uh, on axis they're able to achieve that. There's a little bit of leeway uh, as far as the sweet spot goes uh, where you still can have coincident time arrival from the components within the monitor system. But generally you want to stay in this orientation so it's important if you can't actually get an equilateral triangle to at least be on axis and be the same distance that you are from the left and the right speaker. Of course, the equilateral triangle, uh, the distance between the speakers is going to be equal to the same distance that you are from the speaker. So this distance here might typically be 12 to 16 feet. So this would be 12 to 16 feet, something like that. And I've uh, shown these speakers actually uh, spaced out into the room. Uh, I didn't really draw this very symmetrically, but you want to orient the speakers in the room symmetrically. Um, so I didn't draw these as being actually uh, constructed into a wall system, but uh, we'll show how that can be done. But a lot of times uh, it's just a lot more economical to space the speakers out into the room. Uh, it gives you access to them. You can change them easily and um, a whole, whole lot of uh, benefits. But um, in uh, Tom Hidley's article, the way he suggested treating the um, reflections in the room is to create absorption all the way around. And uh, that's a good way to go. A lot of people think if uh, everything's absorptive, the room is going to sound dead. But um, those people haven't really listened to a pair of uh, good speakers in a... Um, sort of anechoic type environment. They, they sound fantastic. Um, and you can really hear all the detail within the mix, all the spatial cues and everything uh, accurately in that situation. So uh, he advocated using um, panels that are hung from the ceiling. There would be four by eight panels, um, a half inch particle board. They would be spaced out from the wall about uh, six inches and they would uh, extend from about two inches below the ceiling to down to about two inches above the floor. So they're freely suspended. And then uh, he advocated putting one inch uh, thick soft fiberglass on the face of those. And then he would cover this. Uh, he had a stud wall, open stud wall in front of this with uh, um, acoustically transparent fabric stretched across there just to cosmetically uh, cover up the absorption um, 
that he was uh, specifying. And then he actually linked all these panels together so that they would uh, continuously go around the room. And that would definitely, um, you know, uh, eliminate the reflected signal from the sidewall. So normally if you have a speaker here and you have a sidewall, you'll have one of the reflection paths would be from this speaker to the sidewall and then it would uh, bounce back to the engineer's position. Uh, these angles here being the same angle of incidence is equal to angle of reflection. So unless this area of the wall was uh, absorptive, you would have this reflected signal which would come back and destroy your accuracy. Uh, in my article in Mix Magazine, I show uh, by building a, a fourth scale model of the control room that we were uh, doing the construction on. Um, on the energy time curve, it basically shows the first arrival arriving at you know, 10 milliseconds or so. And then the later, this is time in this direction, and then later we'll see the reflection from the um, wall. And then if you analyze the frequency response on this, you'll see there are large reinforcements and cancellations going on. So if you have a bunch of multiple reflections going on in here and you have, you know, these uh, dips and reinforcements um, clustering together, they will really, you know, discolor, discolor the sound. So anyway, um, in this article I show what happens if you then angle this wall so that instead of the reflection going back to the engineer's position, it actually is reflected to the rear wall. And in, in that case also this reflected signal disappears. So you can cause this reflected signal to go away either by absorbing it uh, or by angling the wall. Um, unfortunately, angling the wall does require a little bit more real estate for the uh, layout of the control room. So what you can do in the case of uh, minimizing the amount of real estate required for a, a slanted wall solution would be to stagger these uh, the slanted wall. So if you would come out here and slant this wall, you basically just take sections of this slant and move them inside. So you have a staggered wall situation. Um, excuse, excuse me, I, I need to draw this the other way like this. So these surfaces on the staggered wall sections actually coincide with the angle of the uh, angled wall that that would be constructed requiring more space. And then these are open areas here uh, there where fibrous uh, absorption is installed and with this wedge shape, shape here, you really do get some effective absorption. So um, if you don't want to use absorption on the sidewalls, you can use uh, a slanted wall on the sidewall or the staggered wall construction. Another good reason for using a slanted wall there uh, is that because the slanted wall can be uh, a reflective, you can actually put doors and windows in this slanted wall section that won't cause reflections back to the engineer's position. <clears throat> so uh, that's one way to you know handle door situations. The other thing if you look at uh, the actual uh, ray tracing if you, you can see that as the uh, output from the speaker goes back and and uh, hits the sidewalls that are beyond where the engineer's position is if these sidewalls are reflective back here, it will actually reflect back to the back wall. So it won't create a interference with the first arrival, which means then the um, wall sections that are behind the engineer's position can be reflective. So you can have nice wood panels there or some other decorative kind of elements there, statues even or whatever. And then uh, on the back wall, you just have to make sure the back wall is absorptive. You can put a couch back here to help that as well. So um, you can, um, you know, control reflections 
uh, that way. So you can put doors and windows in these wall sections that are behind the engineer's position. Um, anyway, I, I, I show in my article um, different situations where that's used and I, I also have a photograph of a control room we designed that actually uses the staggered wall geometry and then another control room that uses the a larger splayed wall to control reflection. Uh, you also have the same situation on the ceiling if you have a monitor speaker in here and the engineer sitting here um, you'll see there's the direct sound from the speaker um, which uh, can be interfered with if the ceiling is reflected because there will be a reflection off this flat surface of the ceiling um, and so there needs to be absorptive treatment up here or this ceiling needs to be uh, slanted up from the um, uh, monitors uh, position so if it's slanted up then of course you get sound back, uh, reflecting back to the back wall where it, it needs to be absorbed in order to do this absorption here a lot of times people will suspend a cloud above the uh, engineer's position and this cloud will contain diaphragmatic absorbers for low frequency absorption and uh, fibrous absorption for mid and treble um, frequency absorption and usually this is suspended you know maybe six inches below the uh, ceiling and you put little lights around it or stuff like that little lights in it all that kind of stuff make it look great and that's a good way to handle that um, ceiling reflection problem another um, area of course is the floor reflection and uh, if you <clears throat> take a look at the uh, section th through the control room you'll see and here's the engineer's position you'll see that uh, there's a direct sound and then there's a reflection off the floor that will also interfere with this uh, first arrival from the monitor and fortunately there is a usually a console or some kind of DAW desk or something in here that will interfere with that so you can put a acoustical absorbing panel in front of that uh, console or, or desk area and control that reflection. Uh, Tom Hidley and his design of BOP actually built a pit into the floor um, and put absorption wedge absorbers in the floor. That's kind of a spare no expense way to treat it. There was a, uh, a grid covering over it so you wouldn't fall into it, although I, I think some people had fallen into it. Anyway, uh, that's one way to treat that. I w did want to say something about the front wall too because um, if, you're, if your speakers are sitting out in the room of course like this, this front wall needs to be absorbed because there is a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, energy coming from the speaker that actually gets to there at, at long wavelengths, low frequencies and what have you. There's a lot of energy that gets back here that will reflect back to the engineer's position. And so this has to be absorptive. But if for some reason you need a window in this front wall, you have a voice booth over here, or maybe that's the only place you can put a voice booth, and you want a window here, that window would cause a real problem with reflection. So in that case, what you really have to do is um, move this wall out here to span in between the monitors. And if you do a um, ray analysis, you'll uh, discover that there are no reflected paths from this uh, wall that's been spanning the two monitors that gets back to the engineer's position. So you can have reflective surfaces across this solid this uh, wall here, or you can have a window in that as well. So this wall can be you know really decorative. You can have um, a window, or you can have a um, a big screen display on that wall as well. So anyway, those are the main ways to treat 
reflections um, in control rooms so that you are not interfering with the first arrival accuracy of your monitor. Um, there's a really there's no other way to have accurate monitoring. Um, you can't adjust your uh, first arrival signal or play with equalization or any other performance aspect of the monitor in order to compensate for reflections. Otherwise you're going to destroy the accuracy in the first arrival and if you don't have first arrival accuracy you don't have accuracy. In the future episodes we want to talk about um, sound isolation and in some cases you know you're going to have studios next to each other or you're going to have environmental noises that may interfere with your use of the studio or you may have neighbors that really don't want to you know hear the um, hear the high sound pressure levels that you're generating in uh, your control room so we'll talk about how to control those and um, so until then uh, thanks <laughs>